be more than happy to give that to you and get you hooked up. If you've been here before, then you probably received one, and you know that it's breakable, but it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> um, we will, uh, we're in for a treat this evening. Of course, we've got our, our fellows up here that always do a great job, but we've got Mr. Winters here this evening to, uh, to share the word with us that will be something different for us, right? We'll get to know him and, and the Holy Spirit that resides within him a little bit better before we're done this evening. That would be the goal, right? So everybody, whatever you've got midweek this week, you know, there's nothing you can do about it for the next hour or so. So just let that go. I'm not going to sing to you, let it go, but just let it go, right? <laughs> and we'll be all right. And we can get back to that here in the, you know, tomorrow morning, right? It can be manana. It'll be all right. Um, only real announcement that, uh, that I am aware of, that I know of, is this Sunday evening, we're going to be doing a new thing again, right? This season, this year is about change. We just kind of had a change in season, right? Anybody liking the cooler temperatures a little bit? Kind of nice. So Sunday, we're going to be doing a new thing, and we're going to be doing our G2P, our Gather, Grow, Produce courses, classes about what all we do here as a church and what we believe and where we're going and where we think you could be and where you could go. Uh, to learn more about God and and your gifts from God and how you can then use those will all be done at one session instead of three sessions on three different Sundays. It'll all be Sunday evening starting at 4 o'clock. The goal is to wrap up somewhere around 6-ish, right? Depends on how interactive everybody is. There's nothing wrong with being interactive, right, being connected. Um, but we haven't done them all at once uh, yet, so we're not sure exactly how long that'll take. The goal is to get it done so you can still get home and get kiddos ready for Monday if you need to, or go ahead and go to dinner if you need to, whatever. We'll have light refreshments here for that. But if you've only been able to make one part or two parts or whatever, then come refresh through that and go through the other one. You can get them all knocked out at one time and uh, invite somebody to come along with you, right? Because the worst thing that could happen is they – learn more about what God intended for them because we are all unique. We all have different gifts and we all should be applying them a little bit differently, but together we are stronger, right? That's what we do. So uh, welcome you guys to come and join us for that and bring anybody that you would like to. Kiddos, if they can read and write, they can be a part of it, right? They can learn about those things, right? Um, even those of us that can't read and write so well, we can be a part of it too, right? Just don't try to look at my writing. You won't be able to extrapolate a thing, I guarantee you. Uh, but did everybody get a nice warm welcome? Yes, maybe. All right. Well, hopefully you got a good welcome on the way in. And uh, I welcomed you as well. Let's welcome the one that we're here for this evening. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this day, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house this evening, Lord, with my brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Lord, I pray that you be with Richard this evening, Lord, and and uh, bless him for what he's doing tonight, Lord, to be connected with the word that you've put in with within him, help it to come out and come directly from you, that we might learn more about him while we learn about you, Lord, and, and more about your plan for us as, as we've heard it from him. And uh, Lord, be with our, our fellows this evening, Lord, as they start us into worship, Lord, may worship be able to continue past the song and go throughout the rest of this evening, Lord, and even on our way home. May we be able to continue being in fellowship and in worship with you, Lord, and that we might be able to take it throughout the rest of our week and stay connected with you and not then lose those moments and succumb to the pressures and the stresses of the week, Lord. Help us to be in tune with you throughout all of it. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Well, good evening. Who's ready to have an encounter with God tonight? Did you know that's what worship is about? It's our opportunity to have an encounter with him. So I invite you. That's what I'm going to do. So I invite you to come with me. Y'all go ahead and stand if you're able tonight. My foes are many. They rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not fear the war. I will not fear the storm. My help is on the way. My 
help is on the way. Oh, my God, he will not delay my refuge and strength. Sing it if you believe it tonight. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light oh in darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. Oh, and all will see how great, how great is our 
fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come and rest on us, come and rest on us. In fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come and rest on us, come and rest on us. Because you love me, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. Sing it to him. You're all we want. Everybody feeling good? Fired up and ready? That was some plowing right there, getting ready for the seed. I am so honored to call this man you're about to hear the Lord speak through uh, a dear friend. He's one of the greatest horsemen I've ever known and witnessed. He won rode the horse in 09. He's got the gift of evangelism. He shares the gospel everywhere he goes as a clinician all over the United States and, and sometimes around the world, right, Miss Cheryl? Right? And so uh, it's just a, a humble honor for us to be able to, to come together tonight and hear from him, uh, he and his bride. They champion a Zoom small group on Thursday nights at 8 p.m., amen? Unbridled, 8 p.m. on Thursday nights is a Zoom small group, and a lot of those folks that are on that small group are tuning in, so hello, everybody. Amen. I would like for all of you to give a warm, warm welcome to Brother Richard Winters. All right, Pastor Brandon, thank you so much, buddy. God bless you. All right. 
I am Richard Winters. I'm someone you can afford. And if you can envision a girl maybe in about the ninth grade that no boy's ever paid her any attention at all, but she's been invited to the prom and she's been thinking about it for a week and he's knocking on the door right now. And I don't know if giddy would be the word. That's as good a word as any. I'm that girl. That's how I feel right now. I am just that giddy. I'm just so excited. I, there is no one here that is more excited to be here than I am. This is all I've thought about for a week. My wife will tell you. She said, are you nervous? I said, doggone right, I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah, I'm nervous. <laughs> but uh, truly a blessing, truly an honor. Uh, if our pastor is any kind of pastor, he needs to be a little bit protective of his pulpit. You don't just drop your kids off at anybody's house, right, for an hour. Uh, you kind of need to vet those people and know what's going on. And, uh, and he would not just invite anybody up here. I've enjoyed uh, hearing so many of the leaders over the two or three years that we've been here ministering from time to time. And we've been doing a whole lot of taking from this church and not a whole lot of giving. Our schedule's a little bit crazy. We're gone quite a bit. Uh, but this has just been a blessing for us to land here when we are in town. And uh, you all have fed us and encouraged us. And so we thank you for that. And I was on a Zoom call a few weeks ago, and there's a man that lives out in California, and he's moving to Texas. I think he's moved here now. I've never met him other than seeing him on the Zoom call. And he began to tell this story that on one of his trips down here shopping for real estate, he was in, I think it was a hat store. might have been a boot store. I forget. And he told this story. He says, so I'm there looking at hats, if that's what it was. And there was this old grizzly cowboy sitting there in the corner. So I could just kind of envision what that guy looked like, right? And, uh, and after I got done with my business, we struck up a conversation, me and this old cowboy. And, uh, and he said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm, I'm looking at property. We're thinking about moving to Texas. I said, wow, that's exciting. That's a big deal, moving to another state like that. Can I pray for you? And the guy was just taken back. He said, well, yeah, absolutely. What a blessing. The last thing in the world he expected to hear was that guy right there. That was this guy. This guy, he's the real deal. Okay? He really is. Your pastor has a heart for you. He has a heart for the lost. He wants to see people do well in their lives. He wants to see them grow closer to Jesus. I invited you to a horse show last year. I said, hey, come and, and watch and, sh and let, let me show you what these cow horses do. And, uh, and I tried to get him to sit there and watch, and after a little bit, he got kind of fidgety, and we went and walked around the trade show a little bit, and, and I'm looking at stuff, and I turn around, and he's praying for the vendor over there in the bridal shop, uh, and that's just his deal, you know? That, that guy on that Zoom call is never going to come to this church. He's not going to pay any tithes here. It doesn't matter to Pastor Brandon uh, because he's the real deal, and so I appreciate that you in, in you, Brandon, and... Uh, and how about this first lady, Miss Lori, huh? Uh, just appreciate her so much. I love coming in and going by that kitchen and her there because she just blesses me. She, she says she likes to say our last name. I don't know why she likes to say our last name, but uh, she's just such an encouragement to me, and she's a blessing to you all. She's a giver, and... Uh, new chapter in your all's lives starting right now. And I hope that you will remember to pray for Miss Lori as she makes this time of adjustment. It's going to be a great blessing to the church as she is more available, but there are still things to work out. She had this secular job and, and all the things that were involved there. And, and, and now she's going to be freed up to do so much more for this church. And I know that she would covet your prayers, uh, but we love you guys. So this is Cowboy Church, and we passed seven of them on the way over here. I don't know how we ended up here, but they are on every corner in Texas. They're out west, but not you don't see them near as often. 
But I'm thinking, you know, the Bible says to know them that labor among you. Uh, and as I mentioned, our pastor should be somewhat protective of his pulpit. And this being a cowboy church, let me just lay out my credentials to you and you decide whether I should be the guy or not. Uh, and these are just a few things, stuff I've never done and stuff I have done. Okay, so I've never galloped alongside a running train to save a school marm. I've never done that. But I did learn if you gallop fast enough into a bog hole, your horse can do a complete somersault. I have never fired my gun to stop a stampede at midnight. But I did fall asleep while riding drag on a cattle drive one time. It was a long day. And I've never rolled my own smoke while riding a bucking horse. But I did get bucked off six times before noon one time. That's the truth. And every time I run my tongue along my lower lip on the inside of my mouth, it reminds me of that morning because one of those pile drives shoved me into a bunch of gravel in my mouth and I've still got the scar there. And I never shot a six gun out of a bad guy's hand. I did shoot a steer with snake shot one time trying to get him to turn. It did not help at all. I would not recommend that. But ever since I was a little boy, that's all I ever wanted to be was a cowboy, a horseman, if I even knew what that was. Uh, didn't want to be a policeman or an astronaut or a fireman. I just wanted to be a cowboy, which is kind of odd. Someone said the only thing romantic about being a cowboy is half the things you do are in the dark. And uh, that is probably true. So you decide whether I'm cowboy enough to be here at Cowboy Church tonight. Uh, but we, there is a common denominator. Whether you got penny loafers on or $300 Tony Llamas, uh, we're all in this Christian thing. We're all desiring to draw closer to God. We recognize that without that community, without that fellowship, uh, I mean, I like watching the Lone Ranger on TV, but that don't cut it for Christians. And, and I'm on the edge all the time. I know, that I know I am, so I'm preaching to myself that I need this kind of fellowship. I want to talk about the idea tonight that God is not finished. Amen. Finished with what, Brother Richard? Finished with you. God is not finished with you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you tonight. What an awesome privilege you've given me to step up here and share with these folks. I pray that we wouldn't be wasting anybody's time or just spinning wheels, that you would take up the slack and make the difference where I fall short, and that everything we do and say would honor you, and that by the close of our service tonight that somebody might be stirred uh, and reminded that you are still working good things out in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In the book of Philippians chapter 1, and I'm scared to death. These guys do it so slick. You, your leadership team, they just put this thing up here and they scroll up and down. I think it's going to go black and I'm not going to know what to say. Uh, so back when I was preaching in a lot of churches, there wasn't these things. I think they're pretty, see it went dark right there. You got to keep touching it, I guess. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is Paul writing a letter to a bunch of folks that he used to pastor. He started this church, and he's gone now, but he's dropped this note to them. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with all the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He's not just writing a letter to some random group of Christians somewhere in Philippi. These are folks that he knows. These are folks that he has sat down in their home and had dinner with. These are folks that he very possibly has preached Funerals for their moms and their dads and their loved ones. He's worked alongside them. He shod horses. Well, he didn't probably shoe horses with them, but he probably mended tents with those guys. And so he knew them. This is not just some random thing he's throwing out there on Facebook. He's writing to his old friends. 
And look what he says here in verse 6. Being confident of this, that he that who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What he started to do in your life, in these folks in Philippi's life, whenever that was, when they came to God three years ago, 13 years ago, 35 years ago, he is reminding them that God is still working things out in their lives. He is going to continue to work this thing out even until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, when I was about 12 years old and thought about nothing other than being a cowboy, my folks and how they thought that this would be the magazine to get, I do not know, but they got me a subscription to Western Horseman magazine when I was 12 years old. And they would renew that every Christmas until I was 21 years old. And then I started paying for it, and I've renewed it every single year, or my gracious wife has, (laughs) for the last 40 years, we've never not subscribed to Western Horsemen. I've just felt like, as I've gotten in the horse business, that's kind of like the trade magazine. I always said, you know, uh, know, if if I get a mention in a horse magazine, that's cool, or if I have an article in there, that's pretty cool, Uh, and I'll take whatever, whatever I can get, but... If you get mentioned in Western Horsemen, super cool, double cool. Uh, And so I just always appreciated that magazine. In the back of that magazine, I just looked here the other day, don't have it anymore, but for years, I mean decades, in the classified section, in the back of that magazine was a little ad. And it said that if you would mail in, I forget what it was, $40, $50, they would send you back a book. And they would send you back, I think when the tapes came out, a VHS tape, and it would show you how to build your own saddle for $50. You could have a brand spanking new saddle. And they kept that ad in there for decades. So you guaranteed people were mailing in that $50. I'm just thinking... What happened with some of those guys? Yeah, I need a new saddle. I can't afford a new saddle. Man, they're expensive. You've been down to Tuskegee? You've been up to NRS? Man, they're $2,000, $3,000, $5,000. Hey, babe, I could make my own. $50 here, $200 worth of tandy leather, a couple tools. I can borrow some stuff. We're in. Let's do it. And so, boom, the stuff comes. I go down to Tandy Leather. I get all the stuff. I set it up right there in the living room because that's where I want it be able to work where I'm comfortable. I can watch TV at the same time. And my wife bites her tongue, lets me have all that stuff out there, and I go to work on it, and, and I think I'm making progress for a little while. And then, you know, life happens. You get busy, and I couldn't get to it for a couple of weeks, and Cheryl said, you need to put that in the garage. You can just work on that out there. It's been in my living room for like three months now. You haven't touched it in two weeks. It's going in the garage. Okay, that's all right. It's all right. Summer's over. It's not 150 degrees in there. I'll do it in the garage. So I get it out there, and, and then, you know, you just you get busy. You get distracted. Maybe I got a little bit discouraged because it wasn't coming together as quickly as I thought it needed to. I said, but I'm going to get to it. And I'm just thinking that somewhere in somebody's garage, in somebody's shed, there's a blue tarp. How did we ever train horses before there were blue tarps? I have no idea. There's a blue tarp, and underneath that dusty, dusty blue tarp is a saddle that's about a third of the way put together. And that saddle's never going to come together because that guy's moved on. That is not going to happen. All the enthusiasm, all the excitement, this is going to be just right. I'm going to put these conchos on here. I'm going to put strings that are going to be eight feet long. And man, it's going to be really great. No, it it never got done. Maybe it's harder than I thought. It takes too long. I messed it up. It'll never ride right. I'm over it. So I guess I'm here to tell you tonight God is not like that. There was not a point in your life that he was enthusiastic about your Christian walk and you coming to him and you attending church and praying and reading your Bible. But then 
stuff happens. And that, I mean, that was, that was two marriages and a mortgage ago and three kids and a lot of stuff has happened since then. God didn't say, I'm over him. That's all missing. I was, he was harder than I thought it was going to be. No, God does not do that. The good work that he has started in us, he's going to continue to perform it even until the day of Jesus Christ. And so this is for young Christians here tonight. This is for old timers here tonight. And you might have thought that you and God were on the same page for a while. And you were going to do great things for God, but, you know, stuff has happened. You dropped the ball a couple times, and you're pretty sure that God has moved on to another project. That is not the case. He is not like us. He continues to work things out in our lives. Today, I'm getting so technologically advanced. I was riding horses around all morning, and I had my phone right here in my shirt pocket, and I listened to Genesis chapter 36 through about 50. Okay, pop quiz, Pastor. What's that all about? No. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in there. But it's a story of Joseph. And I would imagine that the majority of you know that story. And if you don't, I would encourage you to fiddle around with your phone tomorrow morning and see if you can't get it to come up and listen to this crazy story that happens to this young man. I mean, Quentin Tarantino can't make this stuff up. Really, the story of Joseph and the story of Esther's, both, both those are just made for the movies. Unbelievable stories. But we're talking about Joseph tonight, and I'm not going to go through all the scriptures, but just to refresh your memory, his journey was one of ups and downs and more questions than answers and wondering, hey, what's the deal? I thought God was doing this and now nothing's happening. It started out as just a young man with family conflict and jealousy within his brothers and, and hatred. And it was, it was just a mess, just a, a sorry, sorry family situation. It got so bad that those brothers got so bent out of shape that one day they took him and they threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. And only by the mercy of God, didn't he? Stuck him in that pit. Eventually sold to some merchants, some guys coming along, heading to a big city. Say, hey, let's cash in on this deal. Sold him for so many pieces of silver. Got into that city. Then was sold to a man's house by the name of Potiphar. And Joseph, this guy, I want to be like this guy because he got a bad rap. He was dealt a bad hand a lot of different times in his life. And somehow he continued to keep the right attitude and continued to keep the right heart. And the Bible says that after a little while, he was running the whole household, this great big outfit that Potiphar had. He, he was the manager of the whole deal to the point that Potiphar didn't even check the books anymore. And then things went upside down, and Potiphar's wife got crazy, and that was a mess, and false accusations came on Joseph. And then he was imprisoned, and what, what happened here? I'm just, I'm just trying to do my deal. And look, now I'm, I'm in prison. We talk about him having a good attitude in that pit, being sold as a slave in prison. But you know what? He didn't want to be in that prison. He was ready to get out. There was a fellow there, he was a butler that got in trouble with the Pharaoh, and Joseph said, and by this time, Joseph, he is, he's like running the prison. He just rises to the top wherever, he at, wherever he's at, but he don't want to be running the prison. He wants to be out of that prison, so he tells that butler, hey, when you get back to the king, would you tell him about me and get me out of this joint? I do not want to be here. You ever been in a spot where you've said quietly or aloud, I do not want to be here. Then it was unkept promises by that butler. Hope vanishing. Helplessness, no doubt. And despair in Joseph's mind. What struck me today, Don, when I was trotting around there, 
I heard it, I think, two or three different times when things went south for Joseph. He said, God was with Joseph. God was with him. I'm thinking if I get thrown in that pit, well, <laughs> that's it. I'm toast. I'm history. God is done with me. The Bible says God was with him. Got thrown into prison. It's going from bad to worse. But God was with him. How many times, Pastor, has someone sat in your office and said, Pastor, how could this happen to me? There's my token Lonesome Dove reference, so I'll get invited back again sometime. When poor Lori had been so abused by those renegades, and Gus finally saved her, and uh, they were there in that uh, dilapidated adobe, and she was crying, and, uh, and she said, they shouldn't have done this to me. They, 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 this shouldn't have happened. And he said, but it did, darling, but it did. Stuff just, it just happens. But I want to remind you tonight that Whatever season you are in, whatever is going on in your life, God is with you during that season. I'm not saying it's a fun season. I'm not saying you shouldn't wish to get out of that season. Just like Joseph said, man, get, tell, the, tell the Pharaoh I'm in here. I shouldn't even be here. But God was with him, and God is with you. In Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, as that story wraps up, Joseph says, talking to his brothers, and you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You intended to harm me. This was, this was going to be bad. This, I, don't, I, I didn't understand why this was happening. I didn't, God didn't give me a glimpse into the future when I was sitting in that pit. When I was in that prison, he didn't tell me how I would one day be uh, the second in command of all of Egypt and my brothers would come back to me. I didn't know about any of that stuff, but now I can see that God intended it for good to accomplish what he wanted to do. And isn't there a New Testament uh, uh, counterpart to that verse in Romans 8 28 that many of you could quote here tonight? It says, We know. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. And whenever I mention that verse, whether I'm talking to a large group or just an individual, I say, now be careful, don't go half-cocked and misquote that verse. Because it never says that all things are good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. But in the King James Version, it says, all things work together for good. We saw it in Joseph's life. There are things that have happened in your life, past tense. It sucked. It was terrible. Looking back now, you can see how God was in it, but you didn't have a clue back then, huh? Mm -mm. We didn't know what was going on. If you were to sit down with my wife and I, if we felt comfortable enough, we could share some stories with you. There have been times in our marriage when we were out in California just a few years ago, we were thinking, my wife said, no, careful, how far are you going here? I'm just going to say that was a rough time, baby. That was a rough time for us in California. But we just believed. As rough as that is, it ain't always going to be like that. I don't know how we're going to get through it. I don't know how long it's going to last, but we are not always going to be in this situation. Because if I thought we were, I don't, I don't know what I'd do. I can't keep going on like that. I know my wife said she wasn't going to keep going like that. But we just believe that God was still working things out for us. We got two kids. They're above average. They're amazing. <laughs> but there have been times in their lives I think of our precious daughter, love her to death. Every time I say goodbye on the phone, she says, love you, Dad. She's made some decisions in her life that just turned my world upside down. So what is going on here? 
I remember a time in Joseph's life. <laughs> this is our son, Joseph, now, excuse me. <laughs> After he got out of high school, I remember him sitting on the front porch. No, he was not sitting, he was standing. And we were having one of those conversations, you know, because I was still paying a lot of the bills, so it's going to be like my, my way, because I'm, I'm paying the way here. I said, Joseph, when you take all the responsibility in your life, then you're going to have all the power. But until then, it ain't happening. And we were talking about what God expects of us. And he told me, he says, you know what, that, that's all right for you and mom, but that's not how I live my life. And I, and I just, just, just cut me and, and hurt me. My boy's living for God now. He loves God now. But that was a time and a season. And if I thought it was always going to be like that, it would be hard for me to cope. It would be hard for me to move forward. But I just kept holding on to this idea that the good work that God has started in our lives, He's going to continue to perform it. I remember, babe, when we lived in San Juan Batista, and we had 10 stalls out there behind our place, those, those portable panels, put a little roof up there, and I'd look out there, and there were four horses in those 10 stalls. They had a lot of extra room to move around. They could switch rooms whenever they wanted. But four horses in a 10-stall barn does not pay the bills. And back when newspapers were the thing, the Salinas Californian, we, we subscribed to that. And I, I sat there at our kitchen table going through the classified ad, seeing what other kind of job could I get? My wife would say, you're going to get some more horses. Don't worry about it. It's easy for you to say. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with your finances right now, and you don't have to show me a spreadsheet after church, but I know that it can be tough sometimes financially, huh? When there's just too much month at the end of the money, and you don't know what you're going to do. Those are the times that we need to hold on and trust God. That the spot that I'm in right now, if I keep believing God, if I keep trusting God, I'm not going to be here next month or next year or three years from now because God is continually doing a work in me. We are all just one doctor's visit away from some, some negative health news. And some of you in this room have experienced that. And and you feel like just physically I'm in this pit. But this is not where you'll always be. God has plans for you. God is continuing to work in your behalf. So Pastor Brandon, when I was 17, maybe 18, I went to work for the H.C. Ranch up in northeastern California. Those of you who don't know much about California, you think it's beaches and Disneyland and weirdos in San Francisco. There's a lot of different things in California. <laughs> and way up in the northeast corner of the state is some big open country, high desert country. And that was the first big ranch, I considered a big ranch, uh, that I had ever worked on. And I went there, and I was going to be, um, in buckaroo terms, because, you know, there's a lot of cowboys here in Texas and up in the Great Basin country, they call them buckaroos. And, you know, what, what's the difference? They say that uh, you know, what, real cowboys won't line dance and real buckaroos won't even watch. Uh, but up there, <laughs> it was buckaroos up there. And he said, you're going to be the bronco man, which means I was going to start all the young horses for this ranch. And I did. That, and, and that was that morning where I got bucked off six times. <laughs> Same horse before lunch. It was a crazy day. Well, they didn't tell me I was also going to run the swather a little bit. And I was also going to pick up round bales in the afternoon after I got done with my colts. So, uh, whatever, I signed up for. But I went to work on the HC Ranch, and they had a bunkhouse. Not like in the John Wayne movies, but it was, it was a narrow hallway and had rooms on either side, and then a big open room down on the end. And there's nothing going on at the HC Ranch after about 8.30 at night, after, after dinner, that you go back down and grease the baler and grease the swather and do all that buckaroo stuff. And this is like very buckaroo to me. Uh, but once you're all done with all that stuff, then I'm just sitting around this bunkhouse, no TV. And I look over there in the corner, there's a bookshelf. Me at 18 years old, being the voracious reader that I was. No, I didn't read very much at all. But there were some books over there in that bookshelf. And as the days went by with absolutely nothing to do, 
I walked over to that bookshelf. And I began to pull out a book or two. Oh, well, that's interesting. At least the cover of the book looked interesting because on the cover of the book was a guy on a horse. And he had his gun drawn, and he was galloping down through a valley. And that kind of looked interesting to me. That summer in 1981, I got turned on to Louis L'Amour. I didn't, I didn't know anything about him. Nobody introduced him to me, but there was about eight or ten of those Louis L'Amour books there, and I got to read those. Hey, other than the front cover, there's no pictures in a Louis L'Amour book. <laughs> but I read them. I mean, them books are, there's over 100 pages in some of them books. That's long books with no pictures in them. <laughs> but I read them, and I got into those books. I got, I got to liking those books because they just resonated with me and that guy on that cover and the guy that they introduced in the pages of that book that's me that's the guy that I want to be that that's not some fantasy story in a book that's an option for me that's the guy I want to be I mean he was handsome he rode a big horse he had guns he worked on a big ranch there was some pretty rancher's daughter that he had his eye on he was taking care of cattle all day yep I'm that guy. Well, I have come to find out after reading a few of those and talking to some others who have read more. You know, Louis L'Amour wrote hundreds of these books. My mother-in-law, good, bad, or ugly, she has every single Louis L'Amour book that he's ever written. I mean, the the boxing books, not just the westerns, all the books that, that he ever wrote and I don't think I'd brag about this. He says, I've read every single one at least twice. <laughs> Mom, you got a lot of time on your hands. That's what I'm thinking. But what I've realized about Louis L'Amour books, they are all the same. <laughs> There's not a lick of difference between any of them that I ever read. Oh, they changed the names. And they changed the country that the guy's in. But other than that, it's the same you know, there, there was uh, Tyrell and Owen and William Tell and, and Jubal Sackett. You know, there were 19 Sackett books? I didn't know that until today. Did a little research preparation for this spiritual message tonight. There's 19 of them from the Daybreakers to Ride the River, Lando, Mojave Crossings, the Skyliners. That's nice, but they are all the same. And this, I'll save you. A little time here if you're not that interested in reading. This is what happens. This guy comes in and he is super cool. And he goes to work on this ranch. And there's that pretty gal and he's running the whole ranch. And um, then some bad guys come. And these bad guys go in and they grab all the cows and they run off. And they take that girl too. And now the guy's standing around, ah! He thinks, I got to go fix this. And so he goes running after the bad guys. Well, then he kind of gets in a bad spot. And now they, he's behind some rocks. And the bad guys are over there and they're shooting at him. He's pinned down. And that happens right around chapter 13. That's when that is going to transpire. And it's been that way in every one that I've read. But I don't recall one time that in chapter 13, oh man, what? Now he's behind the rocks. Now guys are shooting at him. He don't have his girl. He don't have his cows. He ain't got nothing. I'm done. I'm out. Close that book up and, and go do something else. No, I kept reading. Because here's the deal. 14, 15, and 16, Tyrell's going to get around them rocks. He's going to sneak around here, and he's going to start shooting them bad guys up. And then he's going to grab that girl. I don't know. I still don't know how they do this. Throw her up on that saddle with him. There's not even enough room for me when I ride, let alone some girl. But he gets her up there, and, and they gal back to the ranch, and he brings all the cows back. And, and you know, by... Chapter 17, everything's looking pretty doggone good. So, I saved you a lot of time. That's what happens in those Louis L'Amour books. But who would do that 
in chapter 13. Well, I didn't think this would happen to that guy. I mean, he had his act so together. Nobody could shoot straighter. Nobody could ride faster than this guy. Nobody could hit harder than this guy. And to think that now the bad guys got him behind some rocks and they're going to shoot him up? Ah. No, we have faith in Louis. He's going to get him out of that mess. But I have seen people from time to time in chapter 13 in their lives where things are not looking like as good as they were in chapter 3 and 4. And they say, you know what? I'm out. I, I, I can't do this. I, I, I tried this living for God. I, I tried to trust God and everything's just gone belly up and, and this is not working, working for me. My encouragement to them is hey, God is still writing the chapters of your book. He is not done with you. Now, maybe, Pastor, even worse than saying, okay, I'm done and walking away. And this is probably more like I would do because I'm not planning on walking away from God. But there has been a time or two when I've been in chapter 13. That's bankruptcy, too. Huh? What a coincidence. Uh, and I don't think things are happening fast enough. And so I proverbially... Take the pen out of God's hand. Say, God, just give me a minute. I'm just going to get me out of this little mess right here. And just write this next chapter myself and get out from these rocks. You want to talk about a train wreck. You want to talk about things that did not work out well when I couldn't trust God, when I couldn't allow Him to work things out in His time frame. And I got ahead of the game and I just started forcing things and making things happen and leaning on my own understanding and not trusting God him that's the danger in my life i mean anything could happen but i don't, I don't think you're going to see me anytime soon just walk away from god but there are times that i say god give me give me that pen just for a minute because i got a great answer right here that is a mess hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 it says wherefore seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Look at the beginning of verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Do you ever fancy yourself an author at some time? You're going to write a novel, make a bunch of money? There's those 87 pages still sitting in that drawer somewhere. You've moved on, huh? Not God. He has started a story. He started it six months ago. He started it eight years ago, 18 years ago. Whenever you and God got started in this thing, and he is continuing to work those things out. But sometimes when you're sitting in that pit, you think, nope, here's my pit. I think I'm going to just hang some curtains right here. I'm going to dig this out and make a little stool right here because I'm going to be here. This is my spot. No, maybe not. Maybe God has other things for you. He is not finished. He is still writing your story. He is not going to leave you behind that rock. Some of you I know, a couple of you I know pretty well. A lot of you I don't hardly know your story. I told that guitar player over there right before church, I said, sooner rather than later, you and I need to sit down for about 10 minutes, and I want to hear your story. What's your deal? I see you up here playing and blessing me every week. I know he's got a story. Amen. I'm going to figure out what it is. You're going to tell me. So uh, you'll be able to ask me, and I'll tell you once I talk to him. I'm wrapping up here tonight, but let me share this quick story with you that I think illustrates how in unbelievably incomprehensible circumstances and situations, God is still at work. And it is amazing how he can take even the sorriest things in life and turn them around for good. I left high school a year early because I thought I wanted to be a rodeo cowboy. And I went over to this little junior college in Salinas, California. Junior college doesn't cost very much. 
but uh, they, somebody had thrown a lot of money at it and had a great practice pin and all the bucking horses you could ride and all the calves you could rope. I said, yeah, I'm in on that deal. And there was another guy that moved there at that same time. I wasn't that close to him, but, but we rodeoed together. His name was Mitch. And I, I don't really know what his deal was, and we were hung around for a couple of years and then kind of parted ways. <laughs> My wife and I, a few years ago, were in Kalispell, Montana at a horse expo up there doing little horsemanship demonstrations. And in between times, they got these little trade shows. <laughs> they are all the same. Amen, Ann? They are all the same. You've been to one. There, there, yeah, there, there's this. Anyway, I'm walking down this aisle, and this guy says, Hey, Richard. I said, Hey, yeah. I'm trying to act all cool because he acts like he knows me. I'm thinking, well, I'm the headliner here. I'm a big shot here, you know. So, hey, good to meet you. He says, me, Mitch. Hey, yeah, Mitch. Good. To, Mitch Barnes from Salinas. Oh, hey, Mitch, what are you doing, man? In that aisleway, there was this 10 by 10 booth, had a little banner up there, and it was the local... I don't know if it was the actual church or it was a little loosely knit uh, fellowship of, of cowboy churches. And him and his wife were there promoting the cowboy churches in Kalispell. I said, Mitch, what are you doing? Is this your booth right here? He said, yeah, we're inviting people out to church. No kidding. Hey, Mitch, that's great, man. And I didn't quite know how it was all coming together, but... Something happened and said, hey, listen, tonight, let's go out to dinner. Let's get caught up, see what's going on. And so we meet them for dinner that evening. And uh, so, Mitch, here you are at this horse expo in Kalispell, Montana, promoting Cowboy Church. How'd you end up here? Have you, have you been a Christian all these years? Or, or tell me your story. He says, you ready for this? I said, yeah, I'm ready, man. He said, well... Got married, I think it was maybe 20 years earlier, had two lovely daughters, and a few years ago, the daughters were teenagers, and the one daughter got in a terrible car accident and died. And if you have known anybody that's lost a child, we plan on burying our folks, and that's hard, but you don't plan on burying your kids. And... Statistics bear out that marriages oftentimes do not survive that kind of catastrophe. So our, our daughter was killed. We have this other daughter. Um, but um, it was dark days for us. Dark, dark days. And trying to cope mentally with what was happening. Didn't really have God in our lives. The tension between me and my wife was getting stronger, and there was just a lot of conflict there, and, and we were both retreating into our own shells, and, and, and we got a divorce. Oh, wow. So now my mind's going click, 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 because you're sitting by somebody. <laughs> so this got to be number two here. He said, but let me tell you what happened. He said, that... That, that was the darkest time in my life. But shortly after that time, somebody reached out to me, began to share with me the Word of God, and I gave my life to God and became a Christian. Amen. God was doing something unbeknownst to him in his ex-wife's life. He said, after a few months, I called up my ex-wife and asked her if I could take her out to dinner. And we begin to date again. And a few months later, he asked her, would you marry me? And they set a date. And they got married again. And they threw themselves into ministry. And there they were in Kalispell, Montana, in the aisleway of a horse expo, inviting people out to church with Terrible, terrible things that had happened in their lives. That stuff was not good. God doesn't think it's good. Nobody thinks it's good. It's, it's bad. Kids dying, people getting divorced, getting bitter, all that stuff. 
That was, that was terrible, terrible. But somehow God was able to take all of that stuff and bring them back around and make something good out of it. I'm going to invite our worship brothers to come back. And it's very possible that there's somebody here with a tougher story than that. But I'll bet there's not too many of you. Because that, my friend, is a tough story. And if you'd have told Mitch in the middle of that mess that God was working things out for him, that he had a plan for him, he had a purpose for him, I can imagine the questions and the accusations and the railing that could have just poured out of his mouth because of the bitterness and the hurt that he felt. And I know to this day, if, if they are human at all, there's an empty spot in their hearts that will never be filled. There's a wound that will never be completely healed because of the loss of that little child. And so I'm not discounting that tonight. But in the midst of all that, God was still there. And so I'm just wondering tonight if there might be somebody here that kind of thought, you know, I think maybe God's moved on. I think I'm just kind of coasting now. I'm just kind of status quo. I don't really think anything is going to change. I don't have the best job. I don't have the best marriage. I don't have the best attitude sometimes. But you know what? I, it just, it is what it is. My encouragement to you tonight is that the good work that God started in you so long ago, remember when it was fresh and it was new and people were hugging your neck and you were excited about it and you read a scripture that you'd never read before and said, wow, look at what God said here. But that was a long time ago. God has begun to author the story of your life and he is also going to finish that if we will allow him to. I heard someone say the other day, wish I'd have made it up myself. Maybe you feel like you're in a valley, dark place, a yucky place. This guy said, I'm not in a valley. I'm just changing mountains. I like that. I'm just changing mountains. I was on this mountain last year. And there's another mountain out there that God has for me to be on. And I'm going to be on that mountaintop. But yeah, you can't get over there unless you go through this valley right here. But I am on my way. God is continuing my story. And you know people and I know people that in chapter 13, they just walked away. They used to sit here in this church. Friends of yours. And now they're just out there on their own. Doesn't have to be that way. God's saying, wait, wait, I'm not done. I'm not done. I've still got some exciting things for you. i still got great plans for you. Mitch could not even begin to understand what God was going to do in his life. By the time I heard the story, he was on the other side of it. He was just thanking God for, for the grace that had been bestowed to him. But a couple years earlier, it wasn't that way. I'm going to invite you to stand with me tonight. We're going to sing a song. We're going to wrap this thing up and let you go home. But is there somebody here tonight that we could pray with? That we could just come alongside you and encourage you? Not whitewashing, not discounting the tough time that you're going through, but believing with you that God has another mountain for you to get to, that God has great plans for you, that He is not finished with you yet. Brother Singforce, we invite you to come and pray with one of our leaders here tonight. I'd love to pray with you. There's something going on in your life. Let this be a time of remembrance. Yes, God's still doing something in my life.
spirit when you move you make my heart pound when you fill the room you're here and i know you are moving i'm here and i know you will feel me fire and wind come and do it again open up the gates let heaven on in come rest on you love me, Jesus. Spirit was moving. As the Spirit was moving over the waters, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the waters, Spirit come move over us. Come rest on. There is purpose in our pain. We may not be able to see it in that moment, but the moments that we go through the struggles and the trials, God will use it to advance his gospel. It's easy to shout hallelujah on the mountaintops, but we get to know him most in the valleys. And if you're not dead, you're not done. God has a purpose for you. He has spoken to each and every one of you in the house and online. I pray that you respond with bold obedience to what he's revealed to you tonight. Let's make the best looking circle in Wise County. Thank you, Brother Richard.
Guys, let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight. We thank you for this powerful, powerful word, Lord, that we receive tonight. Lord, we receive it. Lord, that you're not done. You're not walking away in this season in our life. Lord, you're going to keep standing by us. God, if we will just apply this knowledge and know it will bring us so much comfort and so much peace in the times of uncertainty in our life, Lord, and most importantly, it will bring us closer to you. God, continue to work in our lives. Lord, I pray for each and every person, Lord. Everyone's dealing with something here tonight. Everyone's got something on their heart, God, and we know that you know us enough to know exactly what that is and what we need, God. So just continue to go with us. Lord, I pray that you be with each and every person that was watching online tonight. Lord, that if they have a need, that they'll reach out and be bold. And Lord, that they'll listen to you and follow you. God, I just thank you uh, for all things in Jesus' name. Amen.